Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be talking about four pet peeves I have with the industry. Now I do have to say, I think overall we're doing a very good job and I think the industry does a very good job of supporting us. When a need arises, they tend to fix it. But there are four things that I want to discuss here that have just driven me nuts over the years, especially since some of this stuff I think has been going on for much too long. Now, a couple of these things I've talked about before, and a couple of them are new. So, let's take a look. Ah, standardized plates. Here's a good one. Now, overall, again, I think the industry has done a pretty good job of standardizing on this, you know, up through the 1980s or the early 1990s. Everybody was just doing their own thing. So if you had to try to mount one manufacturer's optical tube to another manufacturer's mount, you sometimes had to resort to some drilling and tapping or some other modification. So we did do a very good job. And through about the mid-1990s, Vixen was the mount that I thought anyway that we were all going to be using forever. <laughs> I invested heavily in the Polaris and the Great Polaris and the Super Polaris system, only to find around the year 2000 that everything changed and no one was using Vixen mounts anymore. But the one thing that did survive from the Vixen mounts is the good old Vixen compatible plate. These things are so universal now that I think some people forget what this looks like. This is an actual Vixen plate, and you don't see these around very often anymore. But anyway, this spacing and this length is the compatibility here, and you see lots of them here. So these Vixen compatible plates are standard for small to medium sized scopes up through about 12 or 13 pounds or so, like this 8 inch Schmidt Casser grain from Mead. Above that range, we go to something called a D-plate, and the D-plate is a Lausmandy standard. It's not a Vixen standard, but these are the ones that are used for larger scopes. And when you get to the really big stuff, we're still custom again, but the Vixen plate and the D-plate account for, I'd say, well over 90% of your telescope applications. So we are doing a very good job here. But, <laughs> you know, take a look at this. So, we don't have standard lengths here. This is a plate. You see, you see these holes here? I, I, I drill holes. There are holes. The hole spacing is different for every manufacturer. Now, if you only have one telescope, I envy you because you're probably mounted and it works and you never think about it again. The moment you go start owning two or three telescopes, everything changes you wind up having to drill or tap a new hole every time. And you notice I also have to countersink these so the heads don't stick up and they ruin whatever compatibility you have on your saddle plate. So let's take this one for example. So this looks like a plate that fits. It's an ADM plate, I believe. And you see all these holes mean something. All these holes mean something. These spacings are not all the same. And in fact, Mead and Celestron 8-inch mid grains do not have the same hole spacing. This is a Celestron plate. I had to elongate that hole to make it fit the mead. Please give us standardized plate sizes, drilled and tapped, and countersunk for all of the common hole spacings. And I'll give you one that everybody forgets, Teleview. Teleview clamshell spacing does not appear on any plate that I know of except one. This one here, Astrophysics. Their competitor even drills and taps and countersinks these holes for Teleview scopes. Why can't everybody else? Now, people will say that what we really need are slotted plates. These are very good. Astrotech made these. I bought a bunch of these. They all get used. I had to pull these off one of the scopes just to show you. Very good. You, you don't have to worry about hole spacing. But two things. Number one, this is the only length that I could find that you could get them in. And number two, they stop making it. Now at this point, someone usually writes in the comments below and says, you know what, here's a plate that does everything you say. And it does, and I'm happy when that happens, but what I find is after a short time, it disappears. We need one of the major manufacturers to supply standard sized Vixen and D-plate rails drilled and tapped and countersunk for all of the common hole spacings. Please, could you get on that please? You've seen me complain about this one before. 
cheap stamped steel visual backs that come with stock Schmidt Cassegrains. This is what this thing is. If you don't know what a visual back is, this is the thing that couples the optical tube to the diagonal and whatever you're going to put afterwards. You can buy a C14 multi-thousand dollar telescope and it still comes with this cheap thing and it's got a set screw on it, only one. I got a letter the other day from someone who says, I have one of these things and for whatever reason he didn't tighten this down enough or it just worked its way loose over the evening. He had a very expensive diagonal and eyepiece in it. It fell out, it fell onto the driveway. I hear about this stuff way too much. Even if you do tighten down on this, there is no compression ring here, so every time you do this, you're going to put a little mark in your diagonal. These things should be banished. In fact, I have banished them from around here. They are not in the house any longer. I just keep one to show people what you shouldn't do. It doesn't cost that much. Just give us a standard two inch visual back. Now these two things don't look like they are the same, but they are. So this one threads on here like this, and this one also threads on here. It's pretty simple. You just take one off and put the other one on. I can't imagine this thing costs very much, but every time I buy a Schmidt Cassegrain, I wind up having to buy another one of these. Even if you never use the two inch compatibility, you can use a two inch to inch and a quarter adapter, use it in inch and a quarter mode, and this thing is way more sturdy than the stock visual back that comes with these. So please, industry, give us these two inch visual backs as standard equipment. Hey, you, Asian suppliers out there, please fix the spelling and grammar on your website and your marketing materials. This is getting embarrassing. Like the SCT visual back in the previous segment, this is something that's just been going on way too long, and this is something that's easy to fix. You could all fix this tomorrow, but you're not doing it. Now, I was going to put some examples up here so we could all look at these, but I decided not to for two reasons. Number one, I'd be singling somebody out. It's everybody. It doesn't matter what the Asian supplier is. It's been going on. And secondly, I'm just plain embarrassed. When I see some of this stuff come up on a website or in marketing materials or you know, something that I get in, a, in the mail, I want to run behind the couch and hide. <laughs> you know, several years ago, I used to work for a certain well-known Japanese industrial automation company. I was a sales rep for them. And I wasn't even in, in the marketing department, but I walked by one of the marketing guys' desks one day and I saw a brochure, it was a mock-up of a brochure that was going to go out. This is before the era of the internet, so your brochure was the face of the company. And it was filled with mistakes. So I didn't say anything, I just picked up the brochure, went back to my desk and I, you know, I fixed everything, brought it back to the guy. Sometime later, the brochure comes out. Same thing, nobody took any of my suggestions. I went to the guy and I said, what gives, what's going on here? And he said, he pulled me aside, he said, Ed, you, you shouldn't have done that because what you did is you just disrespected your elders by doing this. And I said, as opposed to the disrespect we're all gonna get when the customer sees this marketing material, I don't know, maybe there's a cultural thing going on here where people just don't do this, but if you don't know for sure, hire an English teacher, they'll fix this in an afternoon. You could all have this fixed tomorrow if you wanted to. So here's something that's frustrating to me. You know, these Asian suppliers are getting a lot right. They're getting the hard stuff right. The products are very good. You know, these ED refractors, the 80 millimeter and four inch refractors out there, they're very good products these days. That's the hard part. It probably took you years to develop that stuff. This grammar and spelly thing, that's easy. That should be table stakes. Please fix this and fix it soon. So here, this has been my number one complaint for a long time. And I think of all of the items I'm discussing here, this is the one I think is probably going to get fixed. Please be more forthcoming as to what your amounts actually do. Now, the reason I think this is gonna get fixed is because the smart scopes have shown us that efficient, reliable, accurate go-to systems don't cost very much. And in fact, I think doing it the way the smart scopes do it with the plate solving is cheaper than the traditional way of doing it. We in the hobby know that 
when you see the claims for mount accuracy and the things that the mounts will do, we kind of take it with a grain of salt. But beginners, they don't know this stuff. They buy this stuff and then they just get perplexed when it doesn't work. They think they're doing something wrong. About two years ago now, I got a letter from someone. He bought a 12-inch Mead LX200. Big, smith Cassegrain, $6,750 telescope. Look, I have a Mead 12-inch LX200. Mine doesn't work either. <laughs> and he wrote me and he said, you know, I must be doing something wrong because sometimes it'll find the object and sometimes it won't and sometimes it sort of gets close but it's at the edge of the field of view. It didn't help that as a beginner he was doing what all beginners do. He was using high power which makes everything appear to be much worse. Once I told him to back off on the magnification, things got a little bit better but it was still off. You know, when you spend $7,000 on a telescope and it doesn't always point the way you want it to, I think you have a right to be upset, but those of us who've been in the hobby for a while, we just expect this. So again, I think that the plate solving being used by the smart scopes is going to render all of this obsolete. I think this is going to get a lot better. The second complaint I have about the mount manufacturers is the weight carrying capacity. The payloads that you see advertised on websites are all way too high. <laughs> and the reason they do that is so that you'll buy them. My rule of thumb at this point is whatever the manufacturer claims for a payload, cut it in half, that's probably what the actual limit should be. Now the reason I think some of this is going to go away is because of the harmonic mounts like this AM5 you see behind me. Those have an enormous payload capacity for such a small mount. I think as things move on, we're going to see things get better in that regard. But until now, please, I don't know how you do this because I was in marketing myself. How do you tell the truth without hurting sales? That's a problem and it's a vexing problem. I don't know the answer to that one but I wish someone would find a solution. And one final rant about these electronic mounts, their reliability. Oh my, the reliability. Those of us who have been in the hobby for a while know it is not if, it's a matter of when these things eventually die. This sometimes surprises beginners. This was dead when I first got it. This was dead when I first got it. This is a Celestron Nexstar SE mount. It has died three times. It is currently working. Someone's managed to fix it. This is a Celestron AVX mount. I have four of these. They are all dead to varying degrees. One is completely dead. One I think is on its way out. The other two have mild to moderately serious problems but are still usable as of right now. I also have a Celestron CGE mount, which you've seen me talk about here in this channel. It has died five times, <laughs> and the fifth time it died, it's just gone for good. I don't have it here because I just didn't feel like dragging in 100 pounds worth of mount just to show you something that's dead. You know, last summer I was in our local planetarium, which has an observatory attached to it. They have a C14 on a CGE Pro mount, and a club member and I were just up there one afternoon talking. The talk turned to the CGE Pro mount, and I said, you know, the thing you really don't want to see in a Celestron mount is when you power it up and you see the error code 16 and or error code 17. You see those two messages, you're done for. So we talked for some more. And after a while, he said, you know, let's, let's just turn this thing on just for the heck of it. He turned on the mount, and what do we see on the hand controller? Error code 16 and error code 17. I think they're blaming me for jinxing that mount for saying what I did when I said it. But as of right now, they're trying to work out some sort of a solution. It is not working as we speak. Okay, folks, one last thing. Instead of using my Canon R6, which you normally see me use on these videos, I use this Canon C100 cinema camera. Now, back in 2012, Canon thought that they were going to be the cameras that everybody used in Hollywood and on TV to make their movies, and this was one of the first models they came out with. It had a retail price of $8,000, and it was even more when you have the accessories that I have on this. It never happened for some reason. Everybody's using Ari Alexa these days. 
but I picked this thing up off eBay for something like 5% of its original cost, and I've never used it much. You see it in B-roll sometimes, but this is the very first video I shot exclusively with this camera, and I'm curious to see if you noticed anything. Now the lens, I normally have a 24 to 70 f4L series Canon lens on the R6. This one is a Rokinon CineLens 35mm T1.5. I got that lens for around $100 used. And as for the audio, I was going to say instead of using the Rode Wireless Goes, which you're normally hearing, which you're hearing right now, I was going to use these generic Saramonic mics I got used off Amazon just as I started filming. These cost $28 shipped. The whole system failed on me, so I guess I got my answer on that one. But just wanted to let you know this and to ask you, did you notice that there was any difference in the footage here? And perhaps more importantly, did you care? Okay, folks, there you have it. Four pet peeves I have with the telescope industry. If you have your own favorite, your infamous favorite, let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.